when you were on my headset, my microphone couldn't pick you up. Gotcha. And so my microphone was just like, I only hear Zach, and there's only slight background feed coming in, so you sounded scratchy and blurted, and any time I spoke or responded or laughed in response to what you said, I was basically going right over your audio. It was, it was <laughs> bad. It was very bad. That's no problem. Okay. Okay, so for all the people out in YouTube land, this is version two of my interview with the delightful <laughs> Nikki Nelson Hicks, author of Jake Ishton Hedgy, the Omnibus mm -hmm. Book One, and uh, we're just going to be running through some, uh, you know, softball, softball to hardball interview questions about. We'll the see work. where they go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're likely to go off the rails just as we did oh, the yeah. first time around. <laughs> oh yeah, I can't help it. It's just when my my brain just goes. I will it, go down rabbit holes. Same. It's just the way I am. I'm same. sorry. Just, it's hey, what man. it is. Alice in Wonderland was a great movie. Like, let's do it. Hey, <laughs> so, <you're>, these <sighs> questions are going to sound familiar because you've already heard them. But uh, the first one is the get to know you question. The, right. You are a, a world traveler and an mm -hmm. author and mm -hmm. wife of a reenactor, not re quite a thespian. <laughs> right. <laughs> Recall to the first interview. <laughs> so, let's hear a little bit about that. Okay, so as a world traveler, uh, my husband was in the military, Marines, for like 23 years, 24 years. So we traveled a lot. Uh, we, we lived in Budapest for a while, and then we got to live in, you know, move around Eastern Europe, Germany, places like that. Then we moved to Muscat, Oman, which is in the Sultan of Oman, in the Middle East. That was an experience all to itself. This is before 9-11. Because yeah. we moved back to Cal California, it was like two years after we moved back to California, is when 11 happened. Mm -hmm. And then after that, so that's my world travels. Um, and as for uh, the reenactor, my husband is a reenactor. He does primarily Civil War stuff. Well, he used to. And uh, he was a cross dresser. He did both sides. He did blue and gray. But he pretty much, you know, he did his thing. He doesn't do that much anymore. And then he got into World War I stuff. I'm talking like trench warfare. There's some guy in Arkansas who actually has uh, an entire setup. So it looks like a battlefield in France with wow. trenches. It's amazing, really. You didn't they actually, that uh, guys in bike That's planes cool. come over and they drop like flower bombs on people. I don't. That's what he likes to do for fun. Yeah. I don't. I don't get it. I, he don't I, come home with that. Does sound he, like fun. Well, he's a part of a Highland regiment, so he wears a, a kilt, oh, and God. so he's wearing a kilt, and they're having to go through barbed wire. He'll come home with these just ragged, just cuts on his legs where he's gone through barbed wire because that's what he does for fun. <laughs> Then we got, uh, the now, right now he's mainly into the Roman reenacting. So my garage looks like Spartacus threw up in there. We got Roman, because my husband's a stitch counter. He loved, everything has to be right up to every, all the things. He loves to do that. So there's some guy somewhere, I think it's in Pennsylvania, or it could be Illinois. I don't remember. That's his world, not mine. Uh, anyway, some guy has an entire roman villa set up where they go and they'll do a whole roman encampment and up on the hill there's these people who have their german uh, the germanic tribes like the celts up on the on the hill and they'll have battles i don't whatever they he likes to, i don't know and sometimes that you right now because of covid they haven't been able to get together very much they'll have like these zoom meetings because okay we share an office this is my side his side's over there and he'll have zoom meetings with his roman buds and they'll all be dressed in their togas and whatnot <laughs> with green screen roman vesuvius in the background and and they and they talk for hours about fabric and weaving and I don't get it. I, I'm just I'm, wow. I'm I'm over here with my friends watching horror movies because right. we'll we'll have like a uh, like a Saturday night horror movie night and we'll all get together and watch horror movies and do our own little MST3K riffing on it. So that but we do we share an office. That's his side. This is my side. His side has all the Roman and skulls and stuff, and my side just has the haunted curio cabinet looking thing. But that's basically it. And as for author, yeah, I've written a lot of stuff. I uh, I don't really subscribe to one particular genre. I pretty much, you give me a contract, I'll write it for you. You tell me what you want me to write, how many words, boom, I will, I'll find it. I once had a guy contact me. He was doing an anthology. He was editing an anthology, a steampunk anthology. And he's like, I need one more story, Nick. One more story. Can you write me one? And I was like, well, I don't think about steampunk. And he said, well, just, I'm really desperate. I said, fine, fine. When do you need it? Sunday. I need it in seven days. So I said, okay, fine. 
challenge accepted. I went to a comic book store, talked to the guy, said, look, I need some comics on steampunk. Just show me some steampunk. I just need enough to get a flavor. And uh, I did it in seven days. I wrote... It was called Ectoplasmic Eradicators Wanted, basically because the idea was you had it was superheroes in a steampunk world, and um, I wrote eradic uh, Ectoplasmic Eradicators Wanted, and basically it was like a ghost busters in a steampunk world, and it was these uh, Victorian ghostbusters, but they're, they're, they're scam artists, they're con artists, <laughs> who get hired to do a seance and get rid of this ghost for this woman. And, of course, shenanigans happen. They find out the ghost is real, and the person who's hired them double-crosses them. Uh, it's a good story. It really is. But when I got the rights back for it, I reread it, and it was amazing because I get it in seven days, okay? Seven days. I changed. Oh, it was, it was, the editing was awful. <laughs> and when I got it back, I rewrote it, reformatted it, and I... Republished under my brand, uh, a reven uh, what was it? What's it called? Oh yeah, Revenge of the Blood Red Maid. I got a poster on my wall, um, and uh, but it's fun. I, I want to do more with those characters. Maybe I have a lot like that. I have a lot of stories where I want to do more with those characters. Uh, my monkey mind goes, yeah, but we've got all these over here. I want to do too. So, so, but if somebody gives me a contract and pays me money, well, that kind of oh, supersedes monkey mind. Cash flow is king. Oh, yes. You, also, I'm just, I'm really good. i got to have a deadline. If you don't give me a deadline, I'll just flop around. Uh, that's why I give myself deadlines. I, I give myself a deadline, because I know if I don't, I'll just flop around. So, yeah, I write a lot of different stuff. I think what we're going to talk about mainly is the Jake Ishtinheji. Mm -hmm. uh, Jake Ishtinheji. This is volume one. Volume two dropped last weekend. As a matter of fact, today I'm supposed to get my author's copy uh, sometime today uh, for volume two. Uh, and it's basically 1930s pulp noir set in Las, uh, in Las Vegas, set in New Orleans, uh, and I just, uh, I got this, it was started as like, like a challenge, and I did the challenge, and it just kind of grew, because I, I truly, I, did, I knew nothing about pulp, I knew nothing about pulp, so again, I started reading a lot of pulp, I, I just kind of went down a rabbit hole, and um, I use what I know, because I'm, I'm really into weird stuff. I, okay, I'll just pluck all my weird occult knowledge and flop it into this pulp setting and, and mush it all up and see what happens. And that's how Jake, uh, the story, all the stories came. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but as an author, that's what I do. I don't have, I don't like to box myself. I, I, I'll pretty much write anything, especially if you pay me money. Yep. I, I can't argue with that philosophy. We all need cheddar. So, yes, do. so the the immediate follow up question, and you actually gave me a great segue, is why New Orleans? You remember this question, and and it's oh. still it, we could we could go no, into no it problem. so much. Okay, so Jake started as a challenge. This guy was starting up a anthology called Poultry Pulp. It's going the only thing that had to be was about chickens. It had to be a pulp setting. Mm -hmm. It had to revolve around chickens somehow. It all got started in this drunken conversation at a con about how did you know that they used to make sunglasses for chicken? chickens? They make sunglasses for chickens that are like red or pink so that they can't see the blood because if they see blood they'll just cannibalize each other because chickens are cr well chickens are like little dinosaurs. So Anyway, they decided that sounds great, and again, it's a, it's a con. Everyone's drunk. Um, so this anthology got started, and I was challenged, hey, can you write like a little really, really quick, like 2,000-word story for this anthology? So I did. I wrote A Chick, A Dick, and A Witch Walk Into a Barn, the very first Dick Ish and Hedgy story. Anyway, the anthology never came to pass because, again, it was a drunken challenge. <laughs> but the publisher liked it so much, he said, Okay, do you think you can write me more? And, hold on a second, I find something. Uh, and I said, yeah, sure, let's go for it. Well, writing the first story, I thought, okay, writing this first story, this has to be about chickens, and chickens makes me think of voodoo, and voodoo yeah. makes me think of New Orleans. So I really did. And didn't think about it. None of the Jake did not start out with this huge overarching idea of where Jake Ishtenhedji, the world of. No, I just kind of rolled with it because I'm a very organic writer. I rolled with it anyway. When that story, when that anthology didn't come to pass, and he decided, hey, you want to turn it into a series? And I was like, all right, sure, man. You pay me. I'll do whatever you want. Yeah, right. uh, so we did. 
And because, and I was just very, very lucky that I fell into New Orleans because New Orleans is just rich with history and legend. And it's just, it's, it's basically just begging for stories, all kinds of stories. So I was just really lucky. Just really, really lucky. And then, of course, once I did that, I had to be on the rabbit hole of learning about New Orleans, uh, learning the histories, the legends, and finding other fodder to use in the stories. Because, again, I'm a research geek. I like to, I will fall down rabbit holes like crazy and sometimes get suffocated or just get too much info, too much info. And uh, I can't. You can't have that much info or you'll just get constipated. You can't go any further. I'm just so overwhelmed with all of the info. Right. So... I just pick what I need, don't give me too much, and then uh, I will change things around to suit my story, because I never let the truth get in the way of a good story. I'm reading a, a novel right now where uh, the, the, the monster is called a boo daddy, and again, in my stories, I have a, a, a Boggs boo daddies and a dead man's booty, and I have boo daddies in my book, but he has a different kind of boo daddy. He's actually following the southern, the South uh, Carolina idea. I kind of twisted my idea of the Boo Daddy to be what I needed it to be for my story. Because mm-hmm. that's what we can do because we're God. We can do whatever we want. Artistic license. Yeah. Artistic license. And you know, so, and you know <laughs> right along with, uh, with what you were just talking about research, you know, as writers, if you're a good writer, you, you do your homework. And we, we learn so much about the thing that we're researching, and we, we, we like get this tendency, we want to dump it all on the page sometimes, because we've learned about it, and it's interesting to us, and it's, we, it, in our mind it's relevant, and sometimes we, we don't think about the fact that we're bogging down the story with everything that we threw onto the page, and you do not have that problem, at least in the edited version that I read. It all was go. very relevant. Edited version. Edited version. Yeah. Edited. It was all because highly relevant, and it flowed right out, and it was very That's good. why you have editors. The Sherlock Holmes book I, I wrote, there's a whole section that I think is funny as hell that deals with Victorian pornography. <laughs> and it is funny, and it's cool, and this whole section, and my editor, who happens to be English, who lived near the place that I have this, this story set, and he's also a Holmesian, was like, no, Nicole, no. No, 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 we can't have that. But it's funny. I don't care if it's funny. It's not Holmes. So this whole section tossed. But I thought it was hilarious. But no, no, that's why you have editors. Editors, you've got to have that guy or that woman, that person that goes, all right, this is, yeah, yeah, it's good writing. I love it, but it's, it's not, this isn't the story. Chunk that out. Make it its own story. All right, sweetie? Because it doesn't belong here. Also, you're overgoing your word count. So uh, that's why you have editors. Editors, my God, oh, pr- oh, praise editors. They, they truly do make a story because they help shine and polish the diamond, if they can find the diamond, because I've, I've edited a lot of stories that were just turds when I got them, and turds when they left. You, sometimes you cannot polish a turd, but sometimes they can help you find and polish and craft the story and make it so much better. I always give high praise to my editors, yep. and pay your editors, pay them. So, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it, man, it, that is amazing that we, uh, that we said, wait, that's two for two. I wonder if we're going to get a turkey. Um, the first mm-hmm. time we had this interview, I asked you, I framed it a little bit different because oh, yes. I was, I was, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to lie. I w- some people are really touchy about their work. And I was like, if I ask this ham handedly, is she going to flip out on me? No. <laughs> but I asked you about, I asked you about, there's a few places where I noticed, especially in dialogue from Creole characters, and it mm-hmm. also shows up a little bit in the narrative, word choice. And it's mostly, it is mostly in the first story, the one, a chick, a dick, and a witch. I would be surprised, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, we had a nice little back and forth about how that's where... The it's first crap editing. Uh, I, mean, yeah. I mean, it happens in everything. And, yeah. and I've seen things done from the big five publishing houses. I've seen things yeah. done where it's like, okay, that's wrong. That's wrong. Wrong verb choice, wrong verb. It, or just That's the wrong word you're looking for. Yeah. Or, it's, or it's misspelled, which really gets me. I'm like, that's a misspelling, for Christ's sakes. Yeah, um, yeah and you or, don't have any of those, thank God. Oh, thank God. Well, also, well, I'll have some really good editors, but obviously they miss, and they always miss, they're always going to miss things. There's also that you got content editing, where you've got the people who don't 
don't like for instance, I once read a book where uh, one of the protagonist's girlfriend, her, his girlfriend, starts off the book bald. They make a very big thing that she's a big punk chick and she's bald. But at the end of the book, she has hair that someone's grabbing and pulling down. I was like, wait, 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 wait. And this book takes place over a week. There's oh. no way in hell she has hair. Unless so, it's a wig, yeah. Again, that's just content editing. The editors did not find it. Okay, by the way, and that's why you have so many different, you have different line editors, content editors, um, a lot of people also get people who are, what are they called? Um, like, like sensitivity editors. I don't have that. Because um, I'm like, no. Yeah, those, yeah, the sensitivity readers, uh, yeah, uh, like people that check for like trigger warnings and stuff like that. Yeah. Because uh, I write horror and I'm trying to trigger you. Right. So, no, because um, my daughter wanted me to do something for one of my stories for a trigger warning. I was like, uh, no, because yeah. I write to trigger. Now, I will say this in my Jake stuff, uh, when I first, uh, I tried to tone back on the, the gypsy word because that is quite a slur to, mm -hmm. to the Roma people. So I, whenever I use it, it's used as a slur. When he calls Radu uh, a gypsy, he means it as a slur. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, I, have a, I have friends who actually practice voodoo, so I felt really bad about making this voodoo evil priestess. Uh, so I'm trying to make it so it's she practices voodoo. She just has her own little weird religion because I, I, I don't want to. I guess I have friends who, who yeah. practice voodoo. So, um, I, so I do have a little bit of a sensitivity in her editor. But, uh, again, I never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah. So... I, I kind of fall, I kind of fall to, to the extreme in that I don't believe in sensitivity editing at all. I believe you should write the story and make the story as good as it can be and all be damned what anyone has to say about it. Because if you start editing for, well, this person's feelings are going to be hurt and this group is, isn't going to appreciate it, it starts getting into censorship territory. Well, but now so you're getting you constipated. You can't work. Yeah, you can't work. Exactly. Well, like I told you the story of Coon Hunt, which uh, that got won a literary award. I got a hundred bucks, but I've never. They they told me yeah, we're going to have to change it a little bit because it's a very sensitive topic, and uh, yeah, they took this eight hundred word story that's fine in its own and turn it into almost a 3,000 word story because they added all this crap to it and it's just you took out the heart of the story because the heart the, the story is about a lynching it's about a, a man telling his grandson about the time when he was 12 and he murdered a guy um, it's a terrible story it's a terrible thing and yes I want it to be triggering because it's about a terrible thing exactly. if we start doing that well we're not allowing people to be triggered and art should trigger uh, we're going to be Again, censorship. We're going to be um, hurting ourselves in the right. future. Exactly. When yeah. you start, when you start cushioning everything and padding yeah. everything so that no one has to feel the bad, hurty emotions, you make <laughs> I'm saying, you make people weaker. You make yes. society weaker because if you can't, if you can't process your outrage properly and safely, you're not a complete mature person. Ooh, yeah, that's how we get people to shoot up schools. Exactly. That's I don't how, know that's how, how to we get process. people who, who go riot instead of peacefully protest. That's how we get people right. who, who assassinate politicians. That's how we get people who start civil wars over silly things that could be resolved peacefully. Well, I'm also thinking about workplace violence. People go yes. into their office because they're pissed and start shooting people. I mean... I didn't get erased! Right! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh... Yeah, I used to work with a guy who we always thought if anyone is going to go, it's going to be this guy. It's going to be this guy. So when he finally did retire, we were all kind of like, "When are he's going to come back tomorrow and shoot us all now that he's retired? But no, he didn't. Now he lives out in his little cabin in the middle of the woods like the Unabomber, like I always knew he would. And uh, he we still texts. He, he every once in a while he'll text me, but um, yeah. Yeah, but you know, there's always that guy. There's, There's always, always that, guy. that guy. So, no. But like I said, I write horror, so I'm trying to trigger you. Yep. Man, that... <laughs> we, went from, we went from editing in dialect of language in, 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 and how that, how that came into through in the story. Into workplace violence! Into, into, <laughs> into the Unabomber and workplace violence. <laughs> That's a rabbit hole. 
I once, like I told you before, I was talking to a woman about her wedding cake. She showed me her wedding. She showed me wedding, wedding cake design, all her wedding things. We ended up talking about Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. And we stopped. It was like, how did we get to? Did we we traced it and it did. We 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 just. <laughs> I don't remember how, but we did. We eventually, we always eventually start talking about Jeffrey Dahmer eventually. So yeah. So the next the next question I have for you uh-huh. is uh, your book obviously has uh, in more than one place and more than one of the in fact it's technically in all three of the stories depending on how you look at it. You have a big magic component, a big occult mm-hmm. component, and so um, you know a lot of writers that do that have problems with the ultra conservative, ultra Christian types. And I wanted to know how you have fared in that regard. How have people been like, your story's good, but I can't read it because it's Satanism. Or <laughs> I just can't appreciate your art because it's full of black magic. So, well, so far, I've never had that problem. Uh, because, again, I don't think I'm anywhere on Elon's radar like that. Yeah. Uh, but so far, I've never, uh, the worst I've ever had was whew, this little lady on the bus that when I go to work little old lady she heard I was a writer so she went and she told me look I've got one of your books and I think she got the perverse muse I think it's the one she bought it's an Edgar Allan Poe kind of story and uh, anyway I saw her on the bus and she was reading it and she read it and then she put it down I thought oh god and then two days later she just walked up to me and she's a little old southern Christian lady and she walked up and she went I don't know how your mind works I just <laughs> I just don't know how your mind works. And then I walked away. Uh, I, that's the closest anyone's ever gotten to me to ask, uh, like, what is wrong with your head? No, no. No one's, again, I'm not on anybody's radar like that. And my stuff is so obviously pulp. I'm not trying to convert anyone into anything. Uh, but neither did Harry Potter. I mean, I know a lot of witches, and I assure you, nothing about Harry Potter is Wiccan at all. Exactly. That's what we nothing. were talking. It's like, people really want to get on J.K. Rowling saying she's a witch and everything. It's like, this is a little... Did you read it? Yeah, this is a <laughs> little Christmas. English boy. This is a little English boy <laughs> in England going to magic school, and it's so, like... I, I, not to get on J.K. Rowling, she's clearly a very good writer with the success she's had. She's clearly doing something right. But yeah, she did something. if she did her research, she didn't follow a whole lot of it because so much of the magic is just created out of whole cloth with no lore behind it. No, she did not. She didn't expect it to be, nor did she care about that. And I had a friend exactly. who actually did write books who his his main goal was to try to make a bridge between, because he was a pagan, between his belief systems and the mainstream religions. He was hoping to make a bridge. And kudos for that. But um, I don't have any kind of aspirations like that. I write to entertain. I write to divert. I don't, I'm not trying to change or create any kind of new religion. Go, that's where the money is. But uh, no, 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 no. So, but no, no, even if you read her stuff. And then, of course, she didn't. Uh, no, 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 no. She doesn't, and she doesn't care. It wasn't the purpose or the point of her books. It was about magic. It was about this boy, and he's the chosen one. Again, her books pulp too. It's it's all pulp. It's just fun, fun stuff. Uh, so yeah. I'm not anyway. sure. I'm not sure if I would say it's pulp. I think that I think pulp, as most people interpret that, is a certain genre. It's like it's like the the easy reading, the genre you go to where literally anything can happen. And it's not, it doesn't take itself too seriously. Harry Potter, everything can happen. You can't that's, take that too seriously. I guess that's fair. I guess depending on how you look at it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, fair. even Sherlock Holmes was it's considered pulp because it was a part of a pulp magazine. The Strand was a pulp magazine when it first came out. And you and Arthur Conan Doyle, he hated Sherlock Holmes. He wanted to write, because he wrote these big, long, lengthy historical fiction. This is my true work. And we're like, yeah, yeah, that's great. Can you write some more Sherlock stuff for us? Do you think you could pop? You know, did, have you read? I mean, have you read especially the, the last ones, the ones he just pretty much was just just uh, spitting out? They're crap. They're absolute terrible pieces of crap. And he didn't care. He was making a thousand dollars a story, and back in that day, oh, that yeah. was some bucks. That's, yeah, and that's uh, he, he didn't care. And he he did. He's quoted as saying, "If I'm the only remembered as the writer of Sherlock Holmes, I'll consider myself a failure." And he is. No one reads his other stuff. You're Sherlock, and oh, he. I think he would. I think he would roll over in his grave if he understood that Sherlock Holmes is still 
I mean, you ever, I, I went to a Sherlock Holmes convention once, and that's some scary stuff because you got the Holmesians who are straight Conan Doyle Holmes, and then you got the Sherlockians, and they're the all Sherlock, like Benedict Cumberbatch, Robert Downey Jr., that kind of stuff. And those two schools of thought do not mix <laughs> because you got these guys who look at it and they, they're always, I mean, they had arguments over where Sherlock Holmes went to college, what school, what university did he go to? And I'm like, excuse me. Y'all know he's not real, right? Right. Right. I, got, I, exactly. I had to leave. I had to, I had to leave that that room because I was almost killed. And then you got the other ones who way fetishize John, uh, John and, and Sherlock's relationship, and I'm just like, oh god, okay, no. Yeah, I, those people. Creep I me out. will be over here now. Those, I, and they exist in I mean, every fandom. Every, if if there's fans of it, there's fans that do those creepy matchups. They do the shipping. That they do the shipping. Yeah. Should never exist. And it, it, people like one of my favorite games from my childhood is a game called Final Fantasy VII, mm -hmm. and people love to ship Cloud, the protagonist, who is arch enemies with the uh, antagonist Sethiroth, and people are like, "Oh, but they would be the cutest gay couple," and I'm like, "No, because they literally hate each other. Hate one, each other. One sees one as the li yeah. as like Antichrist, and the other views the other as beneath human scum. He actually doesn't even yeah. see humans as." human because to the to him he does not recognize yeah. humans as anything above scum literally he, yeah humans are inferior well, they don't matter it's, it's like, like people who ship harry potter and jaco malfoy they, they they ship those two together yeah I'm like, it's like and malfoy thinks yeah. potter is scum he's like you mud right. it's like people i don't understand the desire that some people have to make the dudes that hate each other bang have sex it doesn't compute with me it's like the story's good because of this visceral hatred. hatred that's what drives the 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 drama and the emotion and right. if they banged it it, I don't it get would destroy it. it it would make no sense and it would be horrible so your entire way of thinking is gross and don't associate with stop me it. at all just stop, stop it stop yeah stop Oh, I'm sure you've said, well, you know, Sherlock, the Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, at a convention he was at, they were asked to do a, like, a cold read of some fan fiction that turned out to be John Locke fiction, and they stopped it in mid, because they hadn't read it, it was a cold reading, yeah. and they were like, I have to work with this guy tomorrow, I can't do this, right. I just can't. Right. Dude, you realize I'm an actor, right? This is just a gig for me, this is just a job, and people... I don't they don't see actors like that? I do because I've done that. I when I watch a show, I'm always going, "You really hate this scene right now, don't you?" I can see it in your eyes. You hate everything yeah. about this scene. Yeah. <laughs> so that to me is fun. I, I love anyway. I love to anyway. So yeah. Okay. So yeah. I don't know how we got on this subject, but yes. Next question. Okay. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> oh man, classic. And you and you know. Uh, uh, it's a little bit of a reach back. We kind of passed the segue, but you did give me one that I'm going to go back to. You mentioned you had a friend who wrote stuff, and he was trying to be a bridge between yeah. the pagans and the mainstream religions. And that's that kind of gives me a call to aspects of the Dresden novels. And mm -hmm. your work with Jake Ishtenhedji gives a kind of a... It's like if Dresden was in the form of short stories... I think it would look a lot like Jake Ishtenhedji. And I got to that is the most, the highest compliment I've ever gotten for the Jake stuff because I love the Dresden Files. They're great. Um, and, uh, wow, that's really cool. That's really cool to think that maybe I kind of write like Butcher. That'd be really neat. No, I, but, uh, I see that there's a lot of parallels. I really do think there are, yeah. We should get together and have a beer. <laughs> I don't drink beer. But, yeah, so, Not uh, really uh, uh, I drink wine. I'll take wine and whiskey. I don't drink beer. I hate you know, beer. Um, uh, wine is okay. I prefer mead, a uh, honey wine, to any other kind of wine, and I like mm. hard ciders. I love hard well, ciders. Well, I was very happy at my last doctor's appointment. He was telling me, you've got to cut out all your carbs, cut out the sugars and stuff because my blood sugar was too. I said, well, what about the wine? Oh, no, you can drink all the wine you want. Drink all that. Drink all that. Keep wind up. He said, what kind of wine? I said, I, I prefer red dry wines. I prefer that. He goes, oh, yeah. Drink it, drink it, drink it. I love you. You're my <laughs> favorite doctor. Um, we'll get along just fine, Doc. I love you so much. Just drink all the wine. I don't, I don't even care. So, 
Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, uh, we'll back to Butcher and things. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I can't believe that that's a comparison you never get. Yeah, I've never gotten, but that's it, really cool. I really like that a lot you because like the comparison. I love Butcher. Did, did you write the Ishtin Hedgy stuff before you ever read Dresden, or did Dresden maybe influence you a little bit? No, I mean, I read Dresden years before I started writing the Jake stuff. And when I'm writing, I don't read because I can't, I'll, I'll be influenced. Um, that makes sense. I have to be really careful. And until I'm really firmly into the story, once you first start building it, but once you're firmly into the story, I can do whatever I want. But when I'm first starting, i got to be like in a, a little a womb, a cocoon, or I will be influenced by everything. I don't think so. I don't, I, maybe? I don't really think so because that wasn't what I was going for at all. Again, I fell into it. It wasn't like I thought, I'm going to write this right now. Yeah. Um, even, even the conceit of Jake, because the conceit of Jake is... Every, the first chapter starts in first person, present tense, and then we start off into the uh, first person, past tense, and the last, chap last chapter, which goes back to the first chapter, is back to first person, present tense. And that's kind of the, the conceit of all the Jake stories, and something I just kind of did as a whim, and now is a pain in my ass, because I have to do that with all the stories. And I hate it. <laughs> I've, I've really have painted myself into a corner. But it's kind of my challenge to start that. I start every story at the beginning, which is actually the end, and move my way back. And, you know, it, but, it's funny you mentioned that. That's actually, I wanted to address that in the first interview and didn't get around to it. So I'm glad you brought it up. That is something you do. That's probably one of the things in the Jake stories that I don't like. Is, it's I'm one sorry. Of the few things. Uh, not the end of the world. It's your story, right? How you want. But I've, yeah. I've, um, it's to me, it's really hard to do that thing where we start with what happens at the end and then do the build up to it. You know, because for me, it it's just so hard to, it's so hard to do a, a proper rise and fall climb of action. You know, it's pr it's hard mm -hmm. to get the pacing right to make it hit the same. And a lot of stories don't hit properly because we have the spoiler of already knowing where we're going. And it's easy to predict or easier to predict. Yeah, I, I try to make it challenging. So I started off where you don't know. You're pretty much like, and so you're kind of surprised that when you finally do get there, oh, well, now I see it. I'm hoping also that you will have forgotten and be kind of like, oh, 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 I see now. Because I like for to, to lay the seed work, to lay the seeds. And so you'll see as things go. Um, that's what you should always lay seeds. That's laying your oh, little agree. suicide trail. Foreshadowing is a, a wonderful storytelling device. I use it immensely in my own work. You, foreshadowing is quite great. Uh, I'm not a big fan of like flashbacks. Yeah. Well, I it's only mainly. Well, I used to do a lot of flashbacks a long time ago. And tells that our my writers, this one to the writers group I was at. And there's this one woman in the writers group. We were called the Quill and Dagger. We primarily did murder mysteries and things like that. And she's the sweetest person in the world. She never says anything bad. But I had a flashback, and she just went, oh. <laughs> and she didn't have to say anything more. That's all, that's all she had to do. <sighs> and ever since then, I just can't. Because ever I do a flashback or even think about doing a flashback, I'll see her go, oh. <laughs> you know what and that she just, was? She was just tired of seeing them to the umpteenth like, oh, degree. I can't do it. I just can't do it again. Um, and, yeah, but she is. She's one of those people. She is the best. She can manage. I bet she might like good polish a turd. She is truly, she can find good in every little thing. And then there's me just going, this is crap, and walking away. I'm the worst. She's really good. She's really, really good at being able to help you see things and, yeah. I still see her. We're, we're related. So I still see her at family functions all the time. So it's kind of hard having two writers in the, in the family. Uh, well, she's my sister-in-law. So okay. she's the good daughter-in-law. I'm the weird one. My mother-in-law has <laughs> the good daughter-in-law. She does everything great and perfect. And then there's me. <laughs> and then there's the black sheep. <laughs> There, there's me. You're not sure what Nick's going to say or do. So, yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I try to be good. I really do. But no. No. Yeah. Just don't anyway, yes. happen. So, next question. All right. Let's so. do it. Yeah. So, uh, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier. What? And it's always fun to talk about, at least in my opinion, it's always fun uh -huh. to hear about the what kind of research went into various writing. Um, because if we know... 
if we know what the author researched, then we get to see how their work was influenced, what they would used and didn't use. You used and the words are hard. It works. It works. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, I think it's uh, it's just interesting. So, what kind of research did you do for the Jake Ish and Hedgy stories? The very very first story when I wrote it, not a whole lot because again, I was like supposed to be like two. 3,000 words, and I just kind of wrote it off, but I had a, already a working knowledge of, uh, you know, voodoo principles, basics, so I just faked it. I just wrote it, but when I, the rights out, but the second book, uh, when he decided to turn it into a series, I was like, okay, and the second book, uh, Golems, Goons, and Cold Stone Bitches, I had to pretty much, I just locked myself away with my journal and some whiskey and just go, okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do here? And I started journaling and making up an idea. And uh, But for that, I kind of used a book that I'd found at this old used bookstore that had a lot of uh, dealings with, uh, okay, talked about a lot of legends and weird stuff that happens in New Orleans, a lot of legends and stuff that happened in other places like South Carolina. I also have a book that's primarily nothing but tales from uh, slave tales, tales that all the slaves uh, told each other and were being uh, cataloged by an ethnobiologist, I think that's what they're called, uh, back in the 1920s and 30s, because these were some of the slaves who were still around. Well, they were either, yeah, they were they were like in their 80s, 70s, 80s, and they had been slaves before, and this was the, the tales and things. So I have a, it's a great book, and so much fodder. So I use a lot of those things for, not so as for either the, the goons and gulls and cold stone bitches, but they also used it for the Boo Daddy story, so that I could, uh, the Boo Daddy, I, again, I just, I read a lot of stuff. I do. I read a lot of stuff. And I never know what's going to work or what's going to stick or what I'm going to use. But I do read a lot of history, a lot of weird stuff, um, occult stuff, although most of it's crap. But you just read it and you never know what you're going to use. I love old newspapers. You can find some of the best murders because the way they talked and the way they wrote, because they got paid by the word, it's much more flowery. It's much more enticing. And a lot of murders. So many murders. But that's what sells. It still sells. Yeah. That's what sells is yeah. murders. Drama um, sells. We do love a good murder. So as for, you know, to answer your question, what I, what I research, uh, a lot of history. I read a lot of history stuff. I read a lot of um, old newspapers, weird stuff. And again, I never know what's going to stick. Like, for instance, I was reading a book about um, weird places in England. I was just reading it for fun. And I came across this little section of it about the Shrieking Pits in Norfolk. Supposedly, the pagans murdered their victims there, and they can still hear the cries. And it's haunted as all hell. So I thought, that is really cool. Maybe I'll use that someday. And then about a month later, I got approached to write the Sherlock Holmes story. And I said, okay, well, what do you want? He's like, you can write whatever you want. I don't care as long as you keep it in the Doyle canon. And I'm like, cool. I'm going to use that Norfolk thing now. And so I did. I used it. Sherlock Holmes in the Shrieking Pits where he has to go to Norfolk. And he it, shenanigans happen. Um, because I don't want to give too much away. But shenanigans happen. But you never know. As a writer, you never know what you're going to come across to use as fodder. I have notebooks full of, I'm the worst with newspapers. If you give me a newspaper or a magazine, you're probably, so probably going to come back with things ripped out. Because if I find something, rip, put, or I, I use so much ink printing stuff off and sticking it in my, my idea file. Because you never know. So where do I find my do research? Everywhere. I mean, I never know. I never know. But as for Jake, I specifically found these books dealing with New Orleans, some of the legends, some of the old-timey traditions. Oh, oh yeah, for the, at Christmas I actually asked for books about uh, prostitution. There was a <laughs> There was a street, and my mind's gone completely blank. But there was a street where all the all the brothels were. It was big red light red light district, and it's very historic. And I was thinking, yes, I can use this. So uh, for Christmas, my ne my nephew bought me a book on prostitution, because as you do, and uh, that was cool. I I didn't get to use it as much as I wanted to. But I was going to go back into Mama Effie's past, because when she used to be run a brothel in that area. So anyway, everywhere, all sorts of places. I really can't say, like, one place. Uh, I don't. I use Google a lot, uh, but also, if it, uh, uh, well, the very first time I wrote the Jake books, uh, I used the Latin word for, uh, the Latin phrase for salt of life. 
And I actually have a friend who actually does uh, do Latin. And he contacted me and said, next time you need something, ask me, okay? Because I'll, I'll really help you. So in the new version, it has a much updated and a better grammatically correct way to actually say the Latin word. And don't ask me to do it. I have it written on my wall over here so that I can, oh, well, yeah, that's how you do it. Um, for salt of life and it's really good to have people like that I have another friend who's an Egyptologist and I can contact her to get all kinds of stuff for actually about Egypt and and that that kind of weird stuff it's really cool to have really weird friends you gotta have weird friends if you're gonna write weird stuff you gotta have weird friends and I got weird friends all over the place I wish I had more of them <laughs> to let me tell you <laughs> I, I'm not the most sociable person that's one thing that that, that's one of my things to work on. I'm not either. My, I met them through my writers group. I was one of the founding members of the Nashville Writers Group. I, me and three other guys started it on this co what was it, Cafe Coco coffee house porch. And it's now got over 200 members. Um, and through that, I ran a lot of different groups. I met so many different people who have become my friends and still my friends 16 years later. And through them, you meet people. Through them, you meet people. I mean, one of my friends, Paul Bishop, uh, I met him at a convention that I met through someone else, and he is the coolest guy ever. He was an LAPD officer. He worked with sex crimes, and now he writes weird westerns. He is, he's got so many stories from his days back in the 70s in the LAPD. So you can imagine what kind of stories. LAPD, the 70s, sex crimes. Yeah. Um, he's Jesus fascinating. Christ. Also, he is one of the most, uh, he's been used by the FBI as, uh, he's really good at being able to interrogate people. I watched him do it. He was he we, at the convention. He set this kid. He goes, "I'm going to interrogate this kid." Got the kid in front of him, and he's like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. Do you have Aspergers?" And the kid's like, "Yeah." He goes, "Oh, okay. It's cool. It's cool. I, I, I'll just change it. I won't. I won't get in your in your." And afterwards, the father was asking him, "How did you know my son was autistic?" Oh, a lot of people with Aspergers, they do this thing with their lips. That's how I knew. Also, he wouldn't look me in the eye. I figured, oh, this kid's got, he's, he's, he has Asperger's. That to me was fascinating. That he could just look at a guy and go, oh, okay, that's cool. I can uh, change my tactics and he could still break the guy. He can break a guy within 60 seconds. Wow. I think it's a fascinating that uh, that's impressive skill to have. That is. Just to be able to stop and look at a person and just be able to suss them up. I've only been one other person who could do that. I had a boss who could sit down with you and in five minutes know your strengths and weaknesses. He didn't ask you. He didn't ask you questions. He just sat with you and just kind of looked at you. Okay, and he knew. Boom, 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 boom. He was magic. He was a great boss. He's the best boss I've ever had. So anyway, yeah. How did we get on this? I don't know. So back to research. I I read a lot, and as a writer, you have to read a lot, and you never know where you're going to get either inspiration or fodder. Or whatever from you just you know I always kind of figure the muses will dump it on me eventually that's what happened with Golem's goons with Golem's goons and uh, cold stone bitches I had no idea no idea what to do I was kind of like almost scared so I kicked back got my journal got my whiskey kicked back just started googling when so started writing and scribbling and I got this vision just this this scene popped up in my head of a woman she's slouched down outside of Bear's uh, office. She's she's bloody, and Jake reaches down and is like, you know, how can I, uh, what happened? How can I help you? And she just looks up to him and goes, is it here? Is it here? He's like, what? He was like, am I too, am I too late? I'm sorry, what? Oh my God, am I too early? And then she dies. And that's that was the scene. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with that scene, but that's where it's starting. And uh, I, I love Go uh, Golem's Goons and Cold Stone Bitches. It's one of my very favorite it's Jake my stories. Favorite one, yeah. yeah, it is my favorite. It's great. I love the way it ends. The way it ended was so bittersweet and romantic. I just, it was a great story. And I, I'm very, I, when I read it, I'm like, wow, that was really good. Kudos me, you know? Because um, you have to do that. Sometimes, yeah. every once in a while, I'll just sit back and read old stuff just to go, wow, that really sucks. So, uh, this is what you need to learn, or that's not bad. Kudos you, because uh, humility is very important in this art form. Agreed. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. I wrote, um, I wrote a lot of poetry in high school, and some of it I managed to find going through my old high school papers, like tests, I say, oh, and stuff like that. And I just read it, and I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> 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 oh, no. Oh, Into oh the no. fire you go. <laughs> For the oh, world. no, no, no! Ugh. The very first novel I ever wrote, oh my God, what was it called? 
the, the Ozymandias jewel. Oh, it's awful. I still have it. But I was 17 years old, and it's basically this weird space opera slash fantasy. It is crap. And every chapter starts with someone walking down a hall. Every chapter, I'm rereading this thing, and I'm like, what? What? And then it, it hit me. I'm mean, 17 years old. What do you know? You know high school. What's high school? Walking down halls. Every freaking chapter. And it's awful. It is. It's god awful. But, eh, I was 17, you know? And again, all I knew, I was, I was trying to write kind of a Star Wars slash Thieves World. It was terrible. Absolutely terrible. But... Absolutely it. it was so terrible. It was awful. But uh, poetry, no. Uh, I've only ever written one haiku that was actually no. Is it a haiku? I don't know. That was actually passable. It actually got published. I, I am not a poet, and I don't understand poetry for the most part. I always feel like a poet is trying to trick me. I don't. I don't trust them. So, although I like like E.E. E. Cummings and Robert Frost, their words seem very, very like boom, 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 boom. Okay, oh, yeah, I can understand I what Robert you're trying Frost. to say there. Robert but Frost is a lot good of poetry. A lot of poetry just seems like they're just trying to. What are you trying to say to me? Um, and I'm, I'm just not. You're trying to make me feel stupid. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yes, Nick, I'm trying to make you feel stupid. Um, yeah. So, That's not a poetry funny. person. Ah. Uh. You uh you mentioned Bear, and our next Bear. question is about him. Uh, he mm -hmm. is he is the only character explicitly acknowledged in the acknowledgments parts of uh, the omnibus that you have in there, and you say that he's based off a off someone you knew, mm -hmm. and uh, the question that I have written down is: Are any other characters based off uh, people that you knew? Because you know everyone you know everyone says, "Don't piss off a writer; they'll kill you in the mm -hmm. book." And I, oh, I will. almost all of my characters are somewhere between entirely or loosely based off someone I know. So where do you stand on that? Where do I stand on that? Um, again, I go back to my old adage, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Mm -hmm. um, Barrington Gun or Bear Gun, I kind of loosely based him or basically his physicality and a little bit of his 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 of him, his personality, on an old friend of mine, John Cole. John Cole was a gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps. He spent two tours in Vietnam. He was a lifer. That's all he ever did. And he was raised by Jesuits. Uh, so he had this really weird kind of priest monk thing going on. It's a, a, you know, like a monk soldier thing going on. Because he was fascinating. He loved philosophy. He loved, I think, well, I know. I was his only female friend. He didn't like women. He did not like women. Um, uh, it's a long story, but he didn't like women very much. Uh, and uh, so I was like his only female friend. And that's only because I'm not the most chick-like chick you'll ever meet. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the Marines used to tell me, if it wasn't for the fact I know you have given birth, I would think you were a dude. Seriously. <laughs> and, and that's cool. That's cool. I can do that. So anyway, uh, he would call me up and say, hey, so Nietzsche. What did he mean by God is dead? I'll be over in two hours. <laughs> oh, shit. So I'm having to look it up and figure out what to do and to talk. And we'd get together and just talk. We'd talk for hours about philosophy and politics and all kinds of stuff. And John's biggest thing was he would say, Nick, I don't care what you believe in. I don't care what you believe in. But God damn it, you got to believe in something. you just got to believe in something. I believe so that. He was yeah, you got to believe in something, Absolutely. or you'll, you just got to. So he was great. So I wanted to use him. And also, he died like a few months before the book came out, uh, before the first story came out. And I was really happy. Like, yes, I'm glad I could at least do that. John Cole was like six foot four, big, gruff looking, monster looking That's guy. The do. <laughs> yes, he was. Well, no, you see my husband. He's my husband was a sniper. He's a little guy. He's like what five? He's about six foot tall, skinny little guy. Uh, well, he was especially when we first went in the Marine Corps. He could barely make the weight management uh, weight minimum, and he's still a skinny little guy. We're all skinny little people. We're just skinny little people. But uh, no, my my husband is the kind of guy who sits in the back. You'd never know he was in the Marine Corps. Never know. He never curses. If he does curse, something's gone down. I curse like it's a Tuesday. I don't care. I'm, I, but my husband, if, if he curses, the world kind of stops. Like, what the fuck happened? What happened? What just happened? Yeah. So anyway, that's the two um, schools of thought on cursing. Oh, he just he just doesn't he just doesn't do that. And so if he does do it. It means something. Yeah. Um, 
So he was this big guy, very kind of, he looked scary, but he was the only person I trusted with my kids. The only person. Uh, when I gave birth to Daniel, we called John. John came over, took care of Brenna, because my kids are like 18 months between. Uh, he took care of Brenna, and both of my kids love John. I don't think they remember him very much, but um, he was big John. They'd crawl all over him and stuff. Uh, he was just a great guy. So I based him on, I based Bear kind of on him. As for other characters, uh, there is one character in not this volume, it's in the next volume. Uh, uh, anyway, Fishman, was it? Uh, Fish Eyed Men, Fedoras, and Steel Toad Pumps. That's the name of that story. Um, I base a character in that story on Melinda Page, my sister, because I used to have this thing on Patreon called uh, Keyboard Hero and Keyboard Assassin. Keyboard Assassin, you pay me 25 bucks and I'll write you a story where I'll kill you. It's amazing how many people wanted me to kill them. I killed lots of people. <laughs> they wanted to be killed. So I would contact, okay, fine, you want me to kill you, that's cool. So what's your fear? Tell me a little bit about yourself so that I can make this real. And they would tell me what they fear, what kind of person do you want to be, what kind of blah, blah, blah. And then I'd, just, I'd kill them. I'd kill them in the story. Here you go, 25 bucks, you know. My sister was the, she only had two people ask me to make heroes. One was my sister, and she asked me to make her to a hero. She asked me, I want to be, I want to be really smart and funny and, you know, a hero, kind of like Doctor Who kind of thing, you know, fights the bad guys. And I'm like, okay, that's because that's not Melinda. Melinda's very shy, uh, very, very retiring, and uh, doesn't do well with conflict. She's, and she's also bully bait. The woman walks into a room, and trust me, bullies from 10 miles away will find her. Uh, she just is. She always has been. I call her Bundy Bait. I say, sweetie, you're Bundy Bait. If, there is, oh, if there's a pervert serial killer around, they'll, they, we were at a, I shouldn't say this, this is going to be a video. It doesn't matter. We were at a family reunion, a, a, another, not, not ours, another person's family reunion we were guests at. And this guy came over to Melinda's old man and stuck a fork up her butt. It went, ah, looks like you're well done. Who does that? Who does that? What a pig. He's a pig, and Melinda just, my sister just seems to attract that kind of, I don't know. So I created Melinda Page for her, and she's in that book. And as for the, uh, the other stuff, not really. Um, most characters, I just kind of create for the story. Um, John Irving, I saw John Irving talk at the Ryman years ago. And the first thing he said was, the first thing every novelist needs to learn is one. You are not interesting. No one wants to hear about you. Do not write about yourself. Create characters for the story. And I've never forgotten that. And it's true. I am not. I spend majority of my time with my head up my ass sitting here trying to write stories. I'm not interesting. Um, I'm in the house most of the time. So of COVID. My only outside activity nowadays is Pilates. And nobody wants to hear about that. Uh, so they don't want to hear about your Pilates. Um, maybe younger days when I talk about like my ghost hunting adventures, and I have to tell them, eh, it's not that big a deal. When I watch those ghost hunting shows, I'm kind of going like, oh, please. Really? Really? Come on. This is I've, what we're I've, doing, guys. We're walking through the woods a few hours with cameras, pretending that we hear spooky sounds. Uh, we just know it's I squirrels have... fucking in the bush over there. Uh, did you hear that? Do you hear that? I've, I've done my share of sitting in dark rooms waiting for dead people, and you can only do it for so long. We're just kind of like, okay. I mean, I've had experiences, but experiences aren't evidence. And that was always my problem with that particular hobby of mine was I, I, I always became the scully of every group. And I never wanted to be the scully, but I became the scully because I really want to believe. I want to believe. But at the same time, my rational mind's going, really? Okay. Well, let's figure out what's really going on. And there were a couple of cases that we investigated with the group that I was in that was kind of like, okay, I got, I got no clue. There's something weird happening here. But most of the time, we were able to help them figure out what's really going on. Bad plumbing, that was a big thing. One woman was convinced that the demons of hell was coming up from her bathroom <laughs> and we had to tell her no your house is 120 years old and you're you have a sewage leak that's that's not that's not hell you're smelling that's just poo 
That's okay? just good old fashioned ways. Just good old fashioned human ways, and you need to get that fixed because that's just not healthy. It's not. Um, and we help people. I, that was what I wanted to do. Well, that's what you were doing. So I guess back then I was interesting, but now, no. I spend most of my time again just making up stories. Stephen King talked about that once too. He was in interviews. He says, I'm not interesting. I just write stories that are interesting. I'm, I'm a writer. Oh, God. When writers write about writers, it always irritates me so much. We're not that interesting. We're not. <laughs> We're just not. Oh, my God. It makes me crazy. You know, so, I, anyway, yeah. I'm not sure if I agree. I think it, I think it, I, humans are a unique breed. And you kind of take, got to take people as on a case by case. There's some writers who, whether they wrote historical accurate stuff about themselves or uh, they use their own life experiences mm -hmm. to color their writing, there's a lot of writers who were interesting people. Uh, I cite to you Tolkien. That guy was a fascinating character, and he used his experience in the war to create this beautiful landscape, and he used the things he experienced and the morals he believed in to create these great story arcs that just sucked you in. And yes, he went on for several pages about a tree, and I will not forgive him for that. That's no, why no, I, I, won't, I won't read his writing. I, I've never actually read any of his books. I'm a big fan of his work and the things that he's inspired and the universe and the, the school of thought he's given us because most fantasy now is Tolkien-ish fantasy. Yes. He's, he revolutionized the genre. So the man was a creative genius. And it was absolutely partially because he was a fairly interesting guy. He had a heck of a life, though. He was being a part of a war. Uh, I don't have that in my past. That's fair. So, yes, like I said, case by case basis. <laughs> don't have that again. I I have a Tolkien block. Although I will appreciate what he's done, I have a Tolkien block. I cannot read his work. I cannot. I've tried. When I was a teenager, a little preteen girl, these little, these girls were starting a club. And I wanted to be a part of that club, and they said, "No, you can't be because you're not, you're not good." They told I wasn't good enough to be part of their club because um, I didn't read Tolkien. I wasn't good enough, <laughs> and it was gonna be. It was, it was a witchy club, a little. And I'm like, oh, "I'm sorry, yeah, bitches. You say I'm not witchy enough. Uh, you want to come see my bedroom?" <laughs> uh, bitches. So, and it just did. It set this huge Tolkien block inside of me. And whenever I've tried to read it, I just, I just remember them telling me how I wasn't good enough to be in their club. Me. Yeah, um, yeah. I hate true. them so much. I'm still yeah. pissed off. Oh my god! It was stupid. like forty something years ago. Let it go. But I'm sure they're all dead now. Uh, anyway, know, so really I can't read Tolkien, but uh, I'm not much of a fantasy. Oh, that's not true. I love, I love, I love Discworld. I love Terry Pratchett because his fantasy is still rooted in reality. Same with my horror, my stories, even as fantastical as they get, they're rooted in reality. And Discworld, because he's able to use that fantasy world to do great satire on politics yeah. and religion. Oh, he's brilliant. And what's great about his stories is, is they work on so many different levels. You can just read his story for plain entertainment. If you're just not that, if you're not that astute a reader, yeah, you can read and have a great time. Or if you are more astute, you can see the things, the, the things he's yes. teaching you. The, the clear oh, satire, the clear commentary. Oh yeah. my God, feet of clay. Oh geez, oh, small gods. That is a brilliant story about religion. Dealing with, you know, Alm decides he's going to come down and, and you know, see his people. But the deal is, the belief in Alm is so small, when he comes down here, instead of being this big, huge thing, he's this very small turtle. <laughs> There's only one person in all of Ankh-Mapork who really believes in him. Just one. And he's this very small turtle. And eventually he has to learn that the, you know, like, what basically... Gods need us more than we need gods. Now, Gary Pratchett was an atheist, so he did not care much for religion or, or magic or anything. He, he wrote about it, but he didn't care about it. Uh, his beliefs were you know, pretty much that gods need us more than we need them. I mean, they need my sweet, sweet belief juices. <laughs> I'm just a talking monkey on a very small planet. So... Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, Oh, you got the Rona? You got the Rona? I got the Ronies. <laughs> no, I, I got, just got the allergies. What I got is allergies, uh, yes. I've, I've got the allergies. My son, he's not feeling well today either, and it's just allergies because in Tennessee, it's now 80 freaking degrees. 
It was 40 degrees three days ago. Lucky. This is how God weeds out the wheat, okay? <laughs> It'll be 40 degrees, and then three days later, 80. Ha, ha, ha. Who's going to make it? So now we're all, like, going, like, oh, my God, my sinuses can't take this. They just can't take oh, it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. This is living in the South. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, I grew up in Tennessee. So, but my kids did not. They they were born in California. So, yeah, they're like, this this sucks. This doesn't like this at all. So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah, my, I got some congestion up here right now. And it's still because it's winter here, you know. And, and we have a hard winter. We're under yes, Washington. We, we, no, we, we hit late September and it's all uh, into the ice from there. And I still am sitting here congested, and it's it's not fair. It's, it's just not fair. It's just not fair. It's not, oh, my God, have you forsaken me? <laughs> Why do I live in this winter wonder hill? <laughs> well, here, it's like, you know, especially when it comes winter times, like you walk outside, and you're like, why do I live in a world where the air hurts my face? <laughs> the air hurts my face. Why am I living here? So, yes. The but we all breeze like, yes, this. stings. Uh, it does. I can't breathe. Or in the summertime, you can't breathe. you got to be half amphibian to breathe here. The what? There's so much water. It's like this is Lovecraft up here in Tennessee because you cannot breathe unless you're half amphibian. Um, but winters here, especially now that climate's changing and all this kind of crap, all winters are nothing. When I was a kid, it would get pipes would freeze. It was really bad. Now... We pray for at least one good snow day. Just one. I just want one really, really pretty, very polite snow that comes in on a Friday and is gone by Sunday night. That's not no how way nature now. works. It's not. That's how it works here. We have very polite southern snows. They come in on Friday, so you can take the day off. And you have pretty, 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 and it goes away by Sunday. Everything's lovely. We have a very polite snow here. Lucky. If we get snow... We get massacred. <laughs> okay. Well, in, Buda we in Budapest, we got snow on Christmas Eve. We woke up the next day, and it was three feet of snow. It was like from nothing to three feet, and it kept snowing. And I was just amazed. We were walking down the street, and snow be as high as your head, and that's just the way it was. And people knew to get their they, people knew to have their cars off the street by a certain day. If they didn't, they just got plowed over, and your that's where it stayed until Ooh. spring. And but in Budapest. Um, Let's see, from September to around April, late April, there was no sun. It was nothing but gray, shades of gray, and which is why Budapest has one of the highest suicide rates in all of Eastern Europe. And I can explain to you why, because it was, again, That's my it. depression was at its very, very depths in Budapest. And, uh, oh my gosh, but the winter was so freaking cold, and it was... I had never felt that kind of cold. We, our apartment was right across the Danube, and we could watch ice flows go down the Danube, and the wind would just come crashing at our apartment, and it was just amazingly cold. I'd never felt that kind of cold before. So, but then again, in Oman, it got to be 120 degrees, and that was considered, I mean, you could get a sunburn through your windshield. We did. I used to get sunburns through my windshield. Um, you just, you learned in Oman, you learned the, uh, just really the benefit of shade. Yes. Shade was, yes. wow. You, and you didn't go out at daytime. You just didn't. It was too freaking hot. Yeah. Yeah. That's something a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't think about, because we live in a very temperate climate here in, in North America. The U.S. is in a very, it's centered right between one extreme and the other. We're mm -hmm. really lucky in, in America in terms of our climate. And a lot of people don't think about how in other parts of the world where humans live and have lived for time immemorial, you have to actually give a damn about the weather. Because it, what you were just saying, in some parts of the world, if you're out in the sun for more than a few minutes, you're fried. And you die. In another, yeah. in another part of the world, you're out in the cold for a few minutes. You die. You die. <laughs> yeah, it was 120 degrees and sometimes, and you just learn to deal with it. I remember we were living there. Uh, I remember because in Houston, they, they, when we were living there, people were dying from heat. I remember going, it's like 90 degrees and you're dying. It's 120 degrees here. But then again, also, it was, it was a dry heat. So dry heats are very, very scary because you don't realize how dehydrated you are until you suddenly fall over and uh, well, they have to... There's a balance there, in my opinion. I've so I've I've gone to Arizona where my old man is a lot, 
And in my opinion, the dry heat of Arizona is 100% preferable to the muggy heat here. Yes. Because when there's a dry heat, your sweat actually does its job and evaporates and cools you. When it's muggy, you're breathing in water and your sweat water. just drips down you and you feel soggy and gross. And my God, do I hate outdoor sports in Washington summer. <laughs> I, ran, I ran sports in high school. And some one one of the questions I got what from an adult who never did sports in their in their high school career is how do you how do you guys stay hydrated? You sweat so much and I'm like, Well here's the thing about Washington. Uh, you breathe in and you gotta drink a water. So you know <laughs> You don't you don't lose a whole lot of water here very fast. <laughs> you you, you take a couple of gulps before the race, you're good to go. <laughs> we're part of the we're part of the recycling program here. We just bring it in, bring it in. <laughs> no, you're thirsty. <sighs> Take a deep breath, sir. <laughs> it's kind of like here in Tennessee in the summer. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's 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 really same terribly type of muggy. Climate, that swampy, muggy BS. I hate uh, it. So the the oh darn it the last question I yes. I just I just hit the wrong icon on my desktop there. Last question for you. Uh huh. <laughs> we had a we had a really funny go around. I hate that my computer messed up the first interview because there were some really funny go arounds we had in that interview. <laughs> but we had a go around about Jake's name, and oh. yeah, the number one question I asked you: What's the number one question that you get about the Jake Ishton Hedgy stories? And you said. <laughs> the one that I hate the most is his name, how to pronounce his name. And I was so pleased because you pronounced it beautifully. Yep. Very first go, and I was like, yes, because it's a running joke in the stories how to pronounce his name. He does it, I do it, I write it phonetically so that you can pronounce Ishtenhegi. Yeah. Um, and I really, and like, yeah. I really don't get you, because it's very clear to you. It's very clear yes. to me as a reader that it's something. That for some reason, I wasn't sure why it was so important to you, but it was very clear it was very important to you. Because I, I know less than three, and it might have been up to yes. five times in that um, in the first omnibus, that's three <laughs> big stories, we get a phonetic enunciation Mission. of his name. And it's a, and it's a running joke in the story. It's like, yeah, people can't pronounce my name. And people are always talking to him. That's a, that's a, that's a name that you got there. And it's, <laughs> it's a really <sighs> joke. I mean, it's like, but we get it yeah. in the first couple, I think in the first like two or three hundred words of the first story, we get yes. a phonetic enunciation. It's like, how how can you not pronounce this? It's ish, ten. And now do it. It looks weird. I mean, when you look, first look at it, it's like, there's way too many vowels stuck all together there. What is all that about? Um, but no, it's, it is it is a very annoying thing. Uh, I do a lot of interviews, and the first thing the interviewers will ask me right before the interview is, okay, how do you say the guy's name? <laughs> And we'll go through like 30 seconds of Ishtin Hedgy. Ishtin Hedgy. Ishtin Hedgy. Okay, Ishtin? Ishtin? No, Ish. Ishtin Hedgy. Uh, so, and after a while, as a matter of fact, there's actually an audio version of this pro se put out a long time ago. I don't promote it because the reader calls him Ishtin Hedgy. And I'm like, could you not, not only, only does he call him Easton Heggy, he also calls Henrietta Harlux. It's Henrietta Harlow. You should have. It's French. It, it's, obviously, it's Harlow, but he calls it Harlux. You know, Henrietta Harlux I, and Jake French Easton is one of those ones I still struggle with every now and then because, like, that's a, I'm a, I speak English, that's a <laughs> sound. Uh, yes. <laughs> and the Henrietta French, they're Harlow. just like, we, we, we tack an X on everything. Bonjour. Everything. <laughs> I took French two years in high school, and boy, it served me none. So, uh, so I, yeah. I hate the French language because they're just such oh. pretentious bastards about it. I only took it because I was in love with the teacher. I was. <laughs> Puppy love with the teacher. I was, huh? for, okay, well, for, the reason I'm sorry, writing is because I was in love for um, freshman year in high school, 23-year-old English teacher, Mr. Shearer, and I just fell so, uh, I mean, I, did, I had all the fury and passion a 14-year-old virgin can muster. <laughs> and I should write stories. That's quite a picture and I would, right there. <laughs> and I would leave him these stories. I would sit outside and watch him walk to his lime green pickup truck. Oh, it's so embarrassing. Anyway, what he did was to get me off of him was to put me into, he helped me get into this uh, extended learning program for gifted and talented youth. And that's how I got into theater. And through that, 
that's how I got into another program. And through that program, that's where I met my husband. I mean, we've been together since we were teenagers. And so Mr. Shearer basically getting me away from him because it's creepy as I'll get out this 14-year-old girl because he, he taught French and English. And because uh, he came from Walla Walla, Washington. He spoke French. Oh, yeah. I know that yeah. area. Yeah. Yeah. He and uh, we, I, we, people used to tease him and stuff. And anyway, so, but I loved him and he was great. And he let me uh, do scenes and act things out for the class. And he was great. But yes, he was my French teacher. And the only reason I took it for two years is so I could have an hour a day with <laughs> Mr. Shearer. God love him wherever he is. Because if it wasn't for oh, him, I never would have gotten into all that stuff. And then met my husband, and I often, and matter of fact, when we first met to Nashville, I got back in touch with my old acting teacher, and we met at a play, I was with my children, and I said, hey guys, this is Mr. Roberts, and I'll always call him Mr. Roberts, he keeps telling me to call him John, I'm sorry, you're Mr. Roberts to me, this is Mr. Roberts, and if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, thank Mr. Roberts, kids. Thanks, Mr. Roberts. So, <laughs> anyway. Yes. I don't know how I got on this subject, but there we have it. Oh, French. 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 Okay, yes. Which we and came from two, asking two the name French. question about Ishton Hedgy. And then we got into French. I don't know. From Henrietta, um, from Henrietta Harlow. Henrietta not Harlow. Harlux. Because she's Creole and therefore would have some French background. Yep. So, anyway, I was, I was, uh, I don't push that audio version because of the fact the reader didn't have the wherewithal to contact the writer about how to say the freaking words. Just call me. You know where I'm I mean, at. Give me a I don't understand how you could mess it up when it's literally phonetically in the text in of the, the story. story. Like now, I, I've done a lot of... Oh, uh, no, I would have uh, called him. I would have been like, you're redoing this for free because <laughs> you suck. <laughs> I wish it could. Um, I was unfortunately not in the power to do that. That's a pro se thing. Uh, but um, I've done a lot of audio stuff and voice work for people, and I know the importance of it. I mean, I did, I did some audio work for a guy for his book trailer recently, and I called him up and said, look, okay, how do you want me to say this word? And blah, blah, blah. Make sure I got the word right. How do you pronounce this word? Just want to make sure because I didn't want to screw it up. And uh, that's what you do. You just call them up and say, hey, man, how do I say this freaking word? Yeah, that's so. always the safe way to go about it. That's definitely, if you, when in doubt, ask. I'd ask. much rather, I'd much rather look a little bit dumb asking the question than look really dumb because I just bullshitted it. <laughs> One of the great things about becoming an old fart like myself, I don't care anymore about asking questions. I have no problem with looking stupid. One of my Pilates, Pilates trainers says my greatest strength is that you don't seem to care about failure. You just try it and see what happens. I do. I don't. I just fumble into everything. But now that I'm an old fart, I just, if I don't know, I ask. And, uh, eh. and if anybody gives you crap for asking, you give them crap right back. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm trying to help you. I'm right. doing this for free. You want to pay me? <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway. Hey, no. me. My time is uh, valuable. And you're getting it for free. Where's my appreciation? It... Where are my compliments? <laughs> <laughs> I want something pats on my head. I won't be telling him a pretty, pretty pony. <laughs> so, oh, man. No, uh, unfortunately, I have not found that great gold bucket yet maybe someday in the future but not yet but then again my husband who is a huge stoic he's a great fan don't ever get him oh my god don't get him started you need epictitis in your life um he uh he's always saying if you're doing this for the money you're doing it for the wrong reasons you should be doing it for the art which is nice and fine but at the same time i'd like to make some money like, yeah yeah, it's like um, one, I, it just I can't we live in a capitalistic society, and people judge you by how much things are worth. And uh, yeah, I found that to be true when I go to cons. If I sell a book for too cheap, people won't buy it because they're instantly suspicious. If this is only that, this has got to be crap. So if you ch sell it for a lot more, I mean, look, this cost me two bucks to make, so I'm charging you five. That way, I got a dollar in profit. No. Mm -mm. This up for nine ninety nine. Well, maybe that's worth. Seriously? Yeah. God. People are weird weirdos. About 
people really can be really weird about how they view money and how they view exchange of value. It and and people have some really ridiculous notions. There's an entire class of people, and I hate these people because I've had to deal <laughs> with them. Um, and I, yeah, never mind, not going down that rabbit hole. But there's, okay. <laughs> there's the there's an entire group of people who think that if it's theirs, it's instantly worth more. And it's like, oh. sir, no. I know what this is. I know who made it. I know its history. It's worth a hundred. It's not worth five hundred just because it's in your possession. I'll give you a hundred, or I'm gonna go over there and look at the one that's much more beat up that I can get for fifty because it's not worth five hundred. Hundred. I dick. have a long, long. I got a really long resume of a lot of crap jobs, and many of those crap jobs are retail. And working retail will truly kill your hope for humanity. Same. Because yeah, working oh real hard. man, I know what you mean. Oh, re I think everyone in America, since we are a capitalist society, should have to work a Christmas, have at least a few Christmases under their belt, just so they'll be appreciative. Why would you throw in them the into the church. meat grinder like that? <laughs> hey, I had to work three of them. I worked in this Victoriana. I did too mother-daughter shop in Mission Viejo, California. And we all had to wear these long flowing dresses. We all, we, our, our, our secret slogan, our, our secret slogan was, um, we're all virgins here at Allison Rose because we had long flowy dresses and the little girls would want us to twirl to show or it was just, oh yeah, everything was pink and beautiful. And here's the thing. People would come in to buy these dresses and spend two, three hundred bucks on these dresses. And I'm just like, if you wait six weeks, they will sell these things for 20 bucks. Because, oh, again, but, but we had all these nouveau riche would come in and they would spend so much money on absolutely just, I, I knew what it was, I knew it was 300% markup. So, this is why I'll always be poor because <laughs> I'm the worst. Like after Christmas, they would have all the stuff like marked down. I remember one time this family came into the store, and this little girl really liked this little sock doll, this little doll thingy. And I knew it wasn't worth anything, and they were selling it for fifteen bucks. And she, now it was marked down to seven, and she really liked it. And I asked her, "So you you like that?" And she's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's really pretty. Oh, take it. Go ahead and take it." And the parents were like. Oh, we work alone. And the person's like, ah, go ahead. She doesn't take it. It's going to end up in the back anyway. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Take it. Just take the damn thing. I know that it ain't, it's nothing. I know that they, this thing was really worth a dollar. They bought it at Michael's for 50 cents, and they put some stuff on it, and now they're selling it for 15. Okay? So just, I'm the worst. I'm, take it. But, yeah. yeah, retail at Christmas time. If whenever I hear Barry Manilow's Christmas album, I break out in hives. Because we had to listen to that damn thing over and over you and know, over for like six weeks. It's funny you mentioned that. I, there's, a, there's a funny little bit of research that came out. Then it, they've shown that retail workers actually suffer from various uh, mental health symptoms during the holiday season not because of the stress of their job and not because of the customers they deal with but because the music on repeat begins driving them insane and i'm not it, oh. it's been verified it was a peer-reviewed study and i was like yes finally yes. someone looked into it it's stop repeating the same six songs i'm gonna fucking kill myself yes it was Barry Manilow's Christmas album, and if I had to hear him talk about how baby it's cold outside one more time, I was going to kill myself. Or, and it was either, or Mariah Carey's, I, what, what is her big one that they always play? I haven't been in oh, retail for a while. Uh, it's Christmas time, I think is her big one that they always play. I don't, it's well, Christmas time is here again. And I'm like, yes, and now it's time for the gun. <laughs> In that, that particular boutique, we played either that at Christmas time all the time, or we played the soundtrack to Somewhere in Time, that movie. Uh, oh, we I played that over and over it. again, or Sade, for some strange reason. Huh. Over and over again. And one time, we, uh, we were actually playing the Sade CD, and this woman came, and she's like, Oh, I was hoping you were playing Somewhere in Time. I love that. So I had to go in and put the Somewhere in Time CD in. <laughs> So this chick could spend thirty minutes wandering around this boutique looking for looking at little things and listening to somewhere. I'm like, I'm ready to kill myself. 
Right. So, and this is also, I worked there before the internets and stuff, so you didn't have your phone. You were just sitting, staring. Uh, I was there during the OJ. Remember when OJ and his big Bronco ride, his big Bronco drive? Um, you probably too, probably maybe too young. My time. Probably before my time, yeah. Oh, shut up, you. Oh, my God. Oh, so, it's not my fault. I was there when OJ, you know, killed his, uh, you know. So, you know, during the OJ Bronco ride, uh, and all of I 5 was shut down. I remember they had all kinds of police people there. It was amazing. Like, really, I don't think OJ is going to end up in Mission Viejo. I just don't think it's going to happen. It was awful. But yes, I were I have a lot of retail experience, and it's enough to make you just yeah. So I'm humanity. very nice. I'm very. I understand. I've never been a waitress, but I'm extremely nice to them because they handle my food. Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't piss off oh, people who handle your food. Absolutely. Why would not. you do this? That's why, just mean. Why would you yell and at I, the person making your food? You know how, yeah. You know how hard cooking is. It's hard. <laughs> and they're probably back there going, "Oh, that bitch." Okay. Mm, and then they're putting it back on your plate. I, I actually know people who've told me, yeah, we do that. Yeah. If you give us crap, we do we do things to your food. Um, yes, uh, I've never done that, but also I'm, I'm, I, when I go to a mall, I remember when I'm going to a mall, and there was a woman, she had a thousand-yard stare, and I walked up to her, and she's like, oh, oh, I'm really sorry. I said, hey, it's cool. I've worked retail. I know exactly <laughs> where you're at. She's like, I know. It's so dead today. I don't know what to do. I'm so bored. <laughs> I'm like, I, I understand. And, but, but people who, don't, who haven't worked retail, they don't understand. It is you know, a soul-sucking job. Oh, God. It's it's the worst kind of monotony, and it's and it's not made better by the corporate overlords who want you to be this perfect little robot who smiles and waves and is always on task and never has their phone in their hand and is never uh, talking to their coworkers <sighs> for too long and is always mopping or picking up trash or doing something job-related. It's like... There's only so many times I can sweep before yes. I'm sweeping up floor polish. Right. Shut the hell up before right. this broom goes all the way up your ass. <laughs> and, uh, yes, exactly. You can only dust so much. Uh, 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 yes. Luckily, I don't work retail now. Now I'm in a little cube Same. admin job. So um, anyway, I'll take the cube admin job over retail. <laughs> Any day. Any day. Oh God! I, I personal train now, and I'm so happy I switched careers. Oh God, yes! <laughs> it's helping people is so much more fun than sweeping a floor. I would think so. I mean, like I, I had a 6 a.m. Pilates class today, and my trainer, her name is Shana. I just I love her. She's t- teaching the class. I'm there. But she was talking about that, about her personal training that she does on the side, and how much she loves it, and she loves her. She has a great life. If you're working your passion, you got a great life. Yep. I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy for you to be able to do this for your life. Because trust me, I've had I have a long resume of utterly crap jobs Horrible where jobs. you're crying going to work, you're crying coming home from work. Um, Sunday nights, you really do have those Monday like, oh God, tomorrow's Monday um, <laughs> kind of vibes. I don't have that now, but uh, I think it's meant because I'm old. I'm just old and grouchy now. I just don't care. I go do my job, and I've got my creative stuff on the side. I think if you have something in your life, it's that work-life balance. You can have a crappy work life, but you got to have something. If your home life's good, your, your, your work life can suck. you got to have something, but you can't have both be sucky. Ooh, yeah, no. you got to have something. you got to have something. <sighs> well, well, it's that I'm time. Sure. We, we've run through the questions. We just spent a good chunk of a rabbit hole on <laughs> day jobs. I know. Uh, but people don't realize creatives have day jobs. Oh I'm always amazed at people who think they don't. We think I make money at this. Yeah, please. It's it's oh. it's one of those things. Like the starving artist thing. It, it's a trope for a reason because if you're trying to make it based on your art alone, for most of us, it's incredibly hard. You you got to have a nine. If you're an artist, in, especially in this day and age, you got to have a nine to five. Unless you've got all kinds of talents. Because I have a friend who's a great writer, but he's also a hell of an artist. So he's got two streams. He's a, like, like as an actor, if you're an actor and a singer and a dancer, you're a triple threat. Um, he's a double threat. He can do both the things. I can't do that thing. Uh, I'm not I an wish artist. I, could, I wish I could draw that. I could make my book cover. <laughs> yes. I'm lucky. Well, my daughter's an artist. But getting her to do anything is a pain in the ass. So um, it is. It is. And she she must be paid so so <laughs> you need no, she actually did, let me show you she actually did do she did this cover 
uh, Gun Takes a Gander. It's a bear. It's a bear gun story, and she did this cover for me for my birthday. So Why she a did a duck. Do... Is it part Actually, of it? Actually, it's a goose. Oh, it's, it's a gander. Go- right, goose. Gun gander. takes a gander. It. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually really, I wrote it for a, it was a, um, charity anthology for a friend who committed suicide. So we were doing this thing and I wrote a Barrington gun story for that anthology for, um, yeah, for Logan's, uh, suicide thing. Yeah. (laughs) Logan's suicide thing. Um, yeah. Don't commit suicide. Guys, don't do it. It's Um, no bueno. There's no bueno Permanent for anyone. solution to a temporary problem. Such, and you leave behind bad ripples. Bad, bad, bad ripples. And you can't ever take it back because yep. it's too late. You're it's dead. Permanent. Uh, yep. Yeah. So. Anyway, are we the, now we're to suicide. Let's end <laughs> this now. now. Now that we've touched <laughs> on the darkest of the darkest subjects. <laughs> we've steered into the darkness. <laughs> okay. So, uh, end of, end of interview plug. Now that we've now that we've bored people with the minutia of all, I'm of, sorry. all of the I know. insanity and the rabbit holes. You uh, cannot get two ADHD people in the same room. Oh we gotta have one person yeah. here to keep us on track. We we need a moderator, and I'm yeah. I'm supposed to be the moderator, but I'm half <laughs> insane myself. The voices they distract me. And the voices. <laughs> the voices. <laughs> so, I blame the voices. <laughs> In ah. scene. Ah. Okay. okay. In scene. So, end of end of interview plug. Where can people uh-huh. find you? Where do they go to do the things? Oh, okay. So basically, all of my stuff is available on Amazon. Uh, go to the Great Empire of Amazon. Uh, look uh, if Nikki Nelson Hicks or Nick Cubed N I K C U B E D. You'll find me there. You'll find all of my paperbacks and my Kindle. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, Instagram. Again, look up for either Nikki Nelson Hicks or Nick Cubed N I K C U B E D. Um, I do have a blog on WordPress called NikkiNelsonHicks.com. You can find me there. I don't have a really good website yet. That's my next goal is to get a website. Yep. Other than that, that's where you can find me. You find all my stuff yep. on uh, Amazon. And you can also go to Goodreads and look at her books listed there. Mm-hmm. I reviewed you on Goodreads. I went to your Amazon and reviewed the Jake Omnibus story there. Um, mm-hmm. And all of her stuff will be linked in the description as Links. as you do on the YouTubes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, thank you for doing this again. Uh, You're welcome. You, you know, repeating the same conversation. <laughs> we managed to still have we fun. We did, today. actually. We went to whole different rabbit we, holes, which yeah. is why it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, that's the nature of rabbit holes. You know, you dig one hole and then you, you hit a hard know. spot, so you got to branch off down this way, but then that tunnel floods, so we can't go that way again. <laughs> rabbit holes. Rabbit holes. <laughs> Name of my biography is going to be Rabbit Holes. Uh, so, <laughs> rabbit holes and how not to get lost in them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sure you've got a life to lead. I got to get back to my day job, so. Oh, yeah. You know, I got to eat and, and, you know, do other things <laughs> like that. Exactly. So, yeah. it okay. has been a pleasure. Pray to yes. God the audio isn't corrupted on this file. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yes. All okay. right. Catch you next time, Nikki. Okay, see you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you so much for checking out my interview with the delightful Nikki Nelson Hicks. As I said at the end of the interview, you can check out all of her stuff down in the description. The Jake Ishton Hedgy Omnibus was a great read. I really enjoyed it. Um, you can read my review on Goodreads. I will also have it down in the description. Check her out on Amazon. Buy the first Omnibus. Buy the second Omnibus. Damn you, phone. <laughs> and uh, I cannot recommend her enough. Delightful soul, and when she says she keeps it weird in her writing, she she keeps it weird in her writing. So check her out, and I'll see you guys next time.